So somebody that you've spoken to already, do not speak to them again because we will be doing a little bit of interactive work. So you've got 10 seconds to do that. Okay. <laughs> in Moscow, um, in Barcelona, and for the last seven, eight years, I think, in, in Tabadell. But if you look at the back of the brochure, I'm the one who's currently schoolless, but I um, will fix that at some point. Um, in addition to that, I've worked in quite a few countries, and I am just going to do a little shout out because I think it was 11 or 12 years ago, I worked in Turkey, and I've just recently seen my colleague from 11 or 12 years ago, so thanks, Sarah. Um, Stranger, you met again here. Um, in terms of what I've done, I worked as a teacher, teacher trainer, director of studies, and a director of International House in, in some of them most recently, which has been great because it's allowed me to see young learner teacher and teacher training, you're the microphone now, um, from lots of different viewpoints, and that has been really, really useful for me as well. Um, so with that, the idea of fresh ideas which has been mentioned already, I think is really, really important. There are very, very few things that we can suddenly come up with that people haven't come up with already. But as Sarah was saying, it's the way that we go about this and the way that we do this that brings a new freshness to it. And with the idea of fresh as well is also that training. So to keep on top of things, to keep refreshing what we actually know. Okay. And I speak about young learner teacher cognition and teacher training, which I think is very, very relevant for all of us here <coughs> today. Whether from the point of view of a teacher or maybe a senior teacher to bring back ideas to help colleagues, or whether you're involved in teacher training on young learner courses or indeed on centre courses. Um, all of this I make available, so don't worry about writing down any notes. Okay. Um, with that, then I start. Can you put your hand up <coughs> if you are familiar with teacher cognition? What it means? Right, I explain. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a messy construct. That's how it was described because, again, it's not a new idea. It's been around for a very long time. Um, it's very messy because originally it was sort of cognition was related really to beliefs. So the teacher believes this, that's what they do. And the next thing we thought, well, not really, because they do take decisions in the class, so it's influenced by what happens in the class. So that added to the definition. And it continued until someone else said, what about subject knowledge? What they know about their subject influences what they think. So the most recent, this is teacher cognition. It's a range of concepts, beliefs, theories, assumptions, attitudes, knowledge, understandings, all of which are, and this is the difficult part, implicit. Um, they're systematic, they're contextually grounded. It's very, very difficult to get at. The easiest way to think about it is perhaps that it's beliefs, understanding, and knowledge. Okay? So with all of that, why bother? And because those beliefs are essential to teaching practices, and therefore to teacher preparation programs which is what we do, whether it's with young learners or indeed with adults. I put up two quotes that have come up in research that I did on a, on a doctoral program, and we're just going to take a minute with the person beside you. Can you just think about who might have said this, in what context, and when? Okay, so you've got a minute. and we now understand what it is, then 
where does it all start? And there were three main routes. Okay, now the first one in this is the apprenticeship of observation. And this is a term that was coined back in 1957 by Rorty. And it basically refers to what we go through in primary and secondary school. And these make up approximately 13,000 hours, 13,000 hours of watching somebody teach. Seeing what they do, how they do it, all of these different things that we start thinking about, but we don't realise we're doing it. Okay, so by the time we get to possibly 16, 17, we have an idea before we do any training at all, we have an idea of what a teacher is and what they do, okay? Or we think we do. Um, and it's been interesting this morning, we've had a couple of references to when you think back to possibly a good teacher that you had and what they did, or a teacher that you didn't like, or a way that techniques that were used and perhaps didn't work necessarily, but that you were forced to do. And so all of these things have an impact on us. So that's to do with the, with the apprenticeship of observation. The second thing then that leads on is obviously teacher training courses. So whether it's the Young Learning course, whether it's the CELTA, indeed whether it's PGC courses or something like that, we take these ideas to the course because we've decided that we want to be this type of a person or we want to do this type of thing. So we have an idea of it. Um, on the courses then there's an awful lot to get through and um, there's an awful lot of theory, there's a lot of teaching practice um, and it's really, even though it comes across that, it's a one size fits all approach. So all of these people with their different backgrounds, with their different experiences are on the course and they're all going to do this same course. Um, then we've also got to take into account that the tutors on the course are very different, as Sarah was mentioning before, there's different approaches to take, and that has an effect on you as well as the trainee. So you can see not only the theory, but how they go about doing it. So again, this is all by the by, you're working through the theory, through the modules, what you have to do, but this is also an influence that happens too. Um, this basically sets the foundation, okay? And then we have the third one, which is the initial teaching experience. And this is where sometimes problems are a little bit more obvious, maybe. Um, once we have our training course complete, whichever training course that may be, we go into the school. And maybe it's a school that doesn't have support systems set up. Maybe it's a school that says they're young learners, control them for an hour and send them back home. <laughs> or maybe it's a school that doesn't want you to use material which is great because you've learned this on your course, but suddenly you're going from perhaps spending four or five hours for a 15 minute class to having to prepare for 20 hours, 21 hours a week. So it's a very, very different experience that you've been into. You might also have the influence of colleagues who, again, perhaps not older colleagues, but that they have been there for a while and they find things much easier or Suddenly it's a, just a very different experience that you're now having and that you're having to face. So a lot of the time, if there is a problem with teacher training, if there's a problem with the initial teaching experience, the most reliable thing is what has been built up with the apprenticeship of observation. Okay? And this next part, I'll just talk a little bit about the difficulties that, that people face and we have to bear in mind. So the first one, let's talk about the Young Learner course or, or maybe the CELTA. <coughs> We're saying four weeks could be an intensive or an extensive, okay, but that's four weeks, so we've got 30 hours of input um, compared to the rest of it, okay, and the rest of it, which is 13,000 hours, you've already formed a lot of your beliefs. You think you know what a good teacher is, what they should do, what a bad <coughs> teacher is and what they shouldn't do, how you should behave in front of a class, should I stand here and lecture or should I move about or... All of these different ideas we have inside, and we've only got four weeks to get our head around something, before hopefully we get our first teaching job, and away we go. So there's quite a lot to, to do with there, and it's a little bit unfair. Also, during all of these hours when we were doing that, this started when we were six and seven years old. And we don't really have a lot of world experience to base all of this on. We don't know what the teacher was thinking. We don't know the experience that went behind it. We don't know if there was a lesson plan, what her aim was. All we saw was 
the end result. So that was all we were able to base things on. And again, not always the end result, as we know from possibly watching lessons or whatever, is not always what was planned. So again, we're getting a very, very different side to it. If there's a problem with it, we normally go back to the 13,000 hours. Now from the trainee's point of view, we look at the, the, teacher, the teacher training experience and their initial experience. The first one is that when they come, their beliefs are suddenly called into question. Okay? A good teacher does this, and suddenly it might be, well, not all the time, or you haven't considered other things. They encounter theories which run counter to their own beliefs. So they're having to deal with other things like second language acquisition. Is not, you know, your friend who went to another country and picked up the language in three weeks. Or they're young learners, so they'll just take it up anyway. They don't understand that there can be an awful lot of things behind that as well. And the thing is that they are expected to adopt these new theories. There's not an awful lot of time to go through them but they have to show that they've taken them on board. They can see that their colleagues have adopted these new theories as well. So they're under a little bit more pressure to perhaps put their own to one side and get on with doing this. So that we, if we're tutors or we're trainers, can look at them and think, oh yeah, they've taken it on board, they're doing very well. And then in their initial experience, if they go to a school, they're left with the school is adopting a different approach. So all of these things <coughs> the trainees actually are up against while they're trying to deal with teaching practice, perhaps stand in front of a room for the first time and deliver lessons to adults or young learners, deal with class <coughs> management within all of this as well. Now from a trainer's point of view, can you just put your hand up quickly if you're a trainer or a teacher trainer in any way or perhaps a senior teacher and mentoring people? From a trainer's point of view, <laughs> these different studies have shown that they use their information, which they previously had from their own experience, to validate rather, to, rather than reevaluate. And what this has shown is that when they're validating, oh, yes, I agree with that, yes, I know that, then they actually take it on board. They're not using it to step back a lot of the time and actually weigh it up in the light of new evidence from, from research. A lot of them survive the course without any changes to their beliefs. And again, this is not necessarily that they have the wrong beliefs. It is just trying to back it up with evidence and with research which has shown this. And this particular one comes from a course which was a three-year degree program. And they talked to all of the participants at the beginning and at the end. And at the end of three years, they still believed that learning a language was just a matter of sitting down and learning the grammar rules even though apart from anything else, this was not what the course was about and it was not the way that they had been taught. But again, it comes maybe back to the way that we, we deliver this. They're very reluctant to adopt the practices that they disagree with. Um, so they might think it's an idea, but when it comes down to it in class, what they would follow through with is what they believe in. So again, when they have a problem or something comes up in class and they go to their tool bag, they rely on the tools that they know, not these new things that they're not quite sure how they work. Because in a class of young learners, you don't really want to try out things that you're not quite sure how they work. Um, this one was great, where you teach to observation. And I will give you a personal example of this one when I was involved in the Young Learning course. We were in a class, and of course we do classroom management and different techniques. And one of them, you know, we had smiley faces on the side of the board and removed one if they weren't very good or whatever. And I was watching the class with the teacher. And there was one child who was obviously at pains to say something to the teacher. And the teacher was just not looking, definitely not going to answer that question. So I became really interested in what this question could possibly be. So eventually the child was not going to be ignored anymore because he was waving and waving and waving. And the teacher said, yes. Why are there smiling faces on the board today? Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, OK. <laughs> They're there because I'm there. And because I think it's a good idea. So again, it comes back to. They might think it's a good idea, but they don't really agree. And if they don't agree, they're not going to do it. But if you're in the class, they will do it. So we've all had experience in, in some way of doing this. And the last one is the interpretation can be very different from what the tutor wants them to take from it. And this was shown, it was a, a pre-service a pre or a pre-training course with Brazilian teachers. 
and they were looking at the learning skills and they compared what the, what the lecturer had done with them to what they had done in class. And they had each taken different things from the lecture, which was fine, but had a very, very different take on it. So when they approached it in class, again, it was a very, very different take. So these are all the things as well <coughs> that we're dealing with, apart from providing support, providing the input, doing all the teaching practice sessions. So, so there's quite a bit going on, be, going on behind it. Um, the extent of the influence is huge. <laughs> These are just some of the ways in which it has been recorded and studied. So, use of L1, aspects of their planning, expectations. What can young learners do? I don't think they can do very much. I think my job is possibly to keep them quiet. Or, you know, we could extend it in colour, maybe some numbers. So there's an awful lot of that behind it. An understanding of the learning styles, the multiple intelligences. And this can be a yes, that's true. But in the classroom, does it actually happen? Instructions. Quite a few of them think, well, I did tell them what to do, but they just didn't do it. <laughs> True, okay, but did you check? Or were your instructions clear? This type of thing as well. Or the use of materials. <coughs> Subject knowledge. This can have a huge influence. It can, studies with far from, for example, um, a teacher who's very, very familiar with grammar, feels very confident with all of the terminology. No problem bringing it into class. Whereas another teacher who's not just not so confident with it, which possibly may be initial teachers at the start haven't gone into it in a lot of detail, doesn't think that it's necessary to name things. So they work with the grammar, but it's not necessary to point it out. So their own beliefs and their own experience can influence this. Or people with phonology, if they're not very, let's say, confident with the use of phonemes, they just don't do it. So they ignore it. And we tell them, and we do. And our school used to do input sessions on it and we have a lot of yes, that's a great idea. And again, or this, a lot of the studies have shown that it really does come from your own initial learning experience where you had a teacher who maybe picked on you or we had a word where they mocked you or especially with a foreign language where there's an accent involved or not. Your experience here can really influence what happens in your own learning classroom. Do you want them to communicate? Do you want them to feel good? Because sometimes we don't want to say it's wrong because they're really trying very hard. So we have to think of all of the other things that even if we don't do it, why do we not do it? And can we evaluate that and then move forward? Um, that's the theory part of the research. And I'm going to try to link it to the, to the practical aspects of the class. Um, most of the previous findings were based on adults. And this is why I wanted to do it on young learners because until recently, only about 13% of all of the research that has been done in ALT has been with young learners, so we need to start looking into that area. Um, the research that I carried out did reveal that there was lots of cognitions for, for young learner teachers, obviously, and it was very interesting because it uncovered tensions. Now, I call them tensions because the idea is not to say, you said you would do this, but you didn't do this, okay? The idea is to try and understand why, if that's what they truly believe, why this doesn't happen in the classroom. And if there's anything that we can do as trainers or as colleagues to help with that. So the research that took place was at IHLL. And we had four teachers involved in this study. And the data was collected through classroom observations, interviews, and analysis of the whole data. The young learners, then were we picture some of them here, seven and eight years old. And um, they start in school at six years old, but this is our uh, <coughs> second year of them. They're bilingual Catalan Spanish, but in the in the home there might be one that's more predominant than the other. They're in the second year of the Infant School. They're called our Infants Two. And the material that they were using was from primary colours out for the UP. Um, this meant that all of the teachers were using the same book. They were more or less at the same place, which was great because it actually provided another insight into what they, what they were doing and why they were doing. These are the teachers who very nicely volunteered to take part in the study. Um, different ages, same qualifications, whether it was the CELTA, Trinity Tessel, or the OER certificate. Um, the certificate they had done in different places. Um, varied in experience and their, their language, whether it was Spanish or Catalan. 
And with the experience, it was also good to know that this took place in different countries. So some of them had taught in China, in Japan, in the UK, in Spain. And they had actually encountered very, very different contexts. And it was this experience, their own personal experience, apart from the courses, that actually influenced a lot of what they did in the class. So then we're going to answer the questions at the beginning. So teacher two told me this. <laughs> and teacher four the same. So teacher two, because of the context, she did her course, she did her young learner course, and then suddenly she was in Thailand teaching an after school course, but it had 30 students in the class and she had no materials. <coughs> so yes, she thought they liked to draw pictures and sing songs and that was how she managed to do it. And she felt that she didn't put in an awful lot because she couldn't. But basically she said everything she had learned, she just had it unlearned because of the context. And teacher number four, um, he felt this because he felt that he learned in an anti tefl way and it really worked for him. And what he meant by that was that he made charts and lists and he learned the verbs off by heart. And like I said, it worked for him. Um, but he felt a little bit bad saying that. Um, and so in his class, he obviously does what works for him because he's got proof of it. So he felt that he just did whatever needed to be done. So if you came to observe, this is what you wanted to see, I'll give it to you. Then you give me my certificate and then I'll go and teach. I think the most important thing was that they actually felt that these were very, very valid points to make and that they happened every day and that that's what they were up against. <coughs> so from my point of view, it was more like, okay, what can I do to try and deal with this? Or is there something on the course that we're actually missing from this point? So what we looked at and with the results of the study that I carried out that yeah, all of our teachers, um, their experience, their training and their context had a big influence. Some of their cognitions were challenged during their initial training. They didn't think that young learners could necessarily do so much. They were questioning the use of L1 in class, different things like this. Um, all of four of them mentioned how useful it was in practical terms to have this before going into the young learner classroom. And the main thing that they got from the course um, even though it covered many of the different modules and aspects, was a focus on the different learning styles, which they felt was very, very important and they hadn't necessarily realised this beforehand. So, just quickly, um, they came up with eight cognitions. Okay, this was from all the data analysis, this was what they really believed in. With the person beside you, can you just write down, even if it's just one word, um, of things that you really, truly believe relating to the young learner teaching? Okay? One minute. this was just a given for them that young learners needed things to be constantly repeated to do with memorization so it became much much easier for them no matter what they were learning and um, the next one was learning styles um, they were all very very different and we must take this into consideration at all stages use of one in the class there was a divide on this um, and it was very interesting to be able to relate it back to one teacher, for example, felt that it was very important that the teacher not necessarily use, but that the teacher know the L1. Because she remembered that when she was actually learning a language when she was going away in London, she felt very insecure in the class because when she asked the teacher a question, the teacher didn't speak English, so she couldn't translate it, and she was never quite sure that she had the answer. So there was an awful lot of this behind it, which is a very valid point as well. So it's not that they're right answers or, or wrong answers. Um, Everybody agreed that they had to feel comfortable. That if the young learners did not feel comfortable, then they were just not going to pay attention, they were not going to take things in. They were also not going to ask questions, um, which obviously is a very important part of learning as well. The incidental learning was interesting um, because it did come back to one of the ideas that the teacher had that they're young learners and they pick it up. So don't worry. 
lots of incidental learning. The others were more concerned that, yeah, I can try and put in some extra practice in different ways, whether it's routines at the beginning of the class, lots of L1 in the class, <coughs> whether using functional language. <coughs> the scaffolding, which, yeah, they need lots of help. You can't just leave them there and, and expect them to know what to do. Um, and speaking practice. And this came from two who, d who had to sit in class and they didn't get a chance to use what they knew. They felt that they were being held back a little bit, so they made sure that this was in their class. And then the meaning clarification. This link for one of the teachers into the incidental learning. She didn't think it was very important that it was very, very clear with the meaning because it will come up again and they'll get it eventually. So again, this was part of her belief from a very, at the very start which went into her classroom practice. Right. Ten seconds for this one. Can you answer that question with your partner? <laughs> they have some different answers, um, but what they all came up with was vocabulary. Um, easiest thing for, for us to do. Um, and they had three very, very strong beliefs in relation to this. And it was really interesting because it tied in with their overall beliefs in relation to the young learners. So it wasn't that they were thinking of it as a different thing. Lots and lots of repetition, introduced in a variety of ways, and then practiced in a variety of ways as well. Um, so once we had that, um, I decided, okay, we would look in the classroom and, and just sort of see what was going on. So the first one was that young learners need plenty of repetition of lexical items. And when we analysed the data, yes, this happened in a class, but it didn't happen between lessons. So when they had it in a class, it was introduced and they went over it again and, and possibly again at the end of the class, which was great, they got repetition. But these students are coming either twice a week or once a week. So that was it done. And the next week, now obviously we have to think about why, but then the next week it was new vocabulary that was being introduced, so they weren't getting the repetition. So there were lots of missed opportunities between lessons, and why? Maybe because the theory wasn't linked to the practice clearly. Maybe because we need to emphasise midterm planning and long term planning. Or maybe we just simply need to explicitly say that when we're talking about this, we mean over the whole course of the term, not just within one lesson, so that they get a chance to do it again, because it's the same thing, they're like sponges, they soak it up, and if it's not there, it just dries out again. So we have to, to bear that in mind. The second one, which was that they have to be introduced in a variety of ways because of these different learning styles, which was really interesting because they were all introduced visually. Um, and that was kind of a surprise. And then I thought, okay, I wonder why. Possibly it's because we haven't gone over lots of different ways of doing it in another way. So they're doing what they know and what's easiest. But again, it was something to, to think about. And also to think that these young learners were being catered for, but other styles weren't. So to try and possibly build that into some input sessions or, or some theory. And the third one was that they should practice in a variety of different ways. And this happened very well in the classes for planned vocabulary. But it didn't happen for unplanned vocabulary. So when something came up in the lesson that the teacher hadn't thought about, or just a student was checking something, they just translated it. Whether, again, back to their, their use of L1 in the class, they translated it. Now, it's the quickest and easiest thing to do. <coughs> Maybe the teacher doesn't want to go off on a tangent because of their lesson planning, because they don't feel very confident about it. <coughs> but the same thing happened. The other young learning styles weren't being catered for. Um, we could also say that they're missing other teaching opportunities or they could have thought of ways of involving the other learners. Um, but again, it's trying to think sort of, of what's behind it and to make them aware of what actually happens in, in these ways. So the two main things are when do we actually need to deal with teacher cognition? At the beginning. I would say at the beginning of our young learner courses, at the beginning of SELTA courses, you can extend this into anything else because if they're not aware of it, 
they're not going to be able to do anything about it. And to continue throughout their career, depending on their levels of experience, if there's changes, if they have enforced changes sometimes to their curriculum. Because if we don't continue with it, we end up with this expertise versus experience. Now, I'm just going to tell you the differences here. I was going to ask about we keep in mind the time. You could have a teacher who's been teaching for 20 years and is open to new ideas, is constantly thinking about the theory, how they apply it, how they reevaluate their beliefs, what's changed, what's not changed, versus a teacher who is doing the same thing year after year. And probably in all of our contexts, to identify teachers with, with both experience. And this can be very difficult because if it's a teacher who has done their first year repeatedly <coughs> again and again, becomes comfortable with only one level, has only one set of techniques, and is not open to change. So even if we say you should go on a training course, you're thinking, well, I know what I'm doing anyway, I've been doing it for 20 years. So it's this type of thing that we need to, to watch out for. So an absence of awareness raising means there is no change, there's no benefit, we're not catering for young learners, and there's actually no development in terms of their reflected skills. How to deal with them then is the big question. I don't have all the answers. Um, at the beginning, um, a first module on an initial training course, um, linking these approaches to the cognition so that they can actually see what happens in the class and how it applies. Information for the trainers or the tutors or the senior teachers so that we know the background. We know that this is how they learned. Maybe we need to adjust our courses to suit them a little bit better. Sharing of experiences, how they did learn, the teachers that they had, the, the effect of this, what they think they should be doing. And accepting that that's okay, that that's where it started. And it starts for everybody but then we need to reflect throughout and at the end to make sure that they have taken things on board. Continually, techniques for reflective practice. Not saying we need to think about it a little bit more, but saying, have you got a journal? What are your goals? What are your aims for this year? What do you want to choose to work on? What do you want to develop? And providing support for problems. If we say, yes, we're here, we have support. Not just that there are other people in the building, but there's actually times when they can come and talk about things or do follow-up. And also to have regular check-ins, just to make sure that people are actually doing this. And it's very hard because unless you're in a classroom, you don't know what goes on. But if we can make people aware and get them on board with this, then hopefully they should want to actually do it. So overall, creating this awareness is going to be done by teacher trainers, or again, tutor, senior teacher, whatever contact you have with the training. Making sure that they are aware of this on young learner courses, because then they can take it into the young learner classroom. And if they do this, there should be increased learning opportunities because they're catering for everybody, they're taking on board new theories from new research, what has been done. That's a lot to take on board. Like I said, if there are any questions or anything like that from some of the theory, I'll be around over lunchtime during the breaks and we can, we can chat about it. The slides will also be available on the, on the website as well. And there is a rather long email address should you want to be in contact about anything. Okay, thank you.